In today's video, we're going to talk about the basics of pin diodes, or PIN diodes. So pin diodes, in a sense, are similar to the very familiar PN junction diode. This is what you're probably most familiar with. We basically allow current to flow in one direction, we block it in the other. Uh, a PIN diode, or pin diode, is basically the same structure, except that we sandwich in between the P and N type materials an intrinsic uh, region of undoped semiconductor. And this has some interesting properties that we're going to talk about. Now at DC and low frequencies, these two diodes behave the same. They both have the same IV characteristic that you're familiar with. But the effect of adding this intrinsic region is that it winds up storing charge when you're under forward bias. It's like a big bucket of stored charge. Any PN junction, when it's turned on, has some charge kind of built up and stored in the junction. And uh, when you reverse bias it, you actually have to remove that charge, and then the junction turns off. So you may have heard the term for an ordinary diode called the reverse recovery time. And that's a measure of how long it takes to re remove the stored charge and effectively turn the diode off. Fast switching diodes, like a 1N4148, for example, that reverse recovery time is typically spec'd in single-digit nanoseconds. On a PIN diode, it's orders of magnitude longer. Okay, that we've got a lot more stored charge, a much larger bucket of stored charge with the intrinsic region there. So a PIN diode would make a lousy fast rectifier or fast switch. Okay, but there's other things that it winds up being very good at. So again, the intrinsic region stores charge, or carriers, and uh, as I mentioned, all those carriers have to be removed before the diode actually turns off, or the junction turns off. So uh, in, in this case, we've got a large bucket of stored charge, so when we start to turn the diode off, there will be a substantial reverse current that can flow. We'll take advantage of that. So at high frequencies, for example, we've got a you know, high frequency signal going through that diode, okay, forward biasing and reverse biasing that diode. There may not be enough time during the negative half cycle to completely empty the bucket. So if we don't empty the bucket, the diode never turns off. So you know, if I've got this bucket full of charge that's created by forward biasing the diode, I can essentially make RF current flow in both directions because there isn't enough time to kind of completely deplete it. So that's interesting. And uh, the inter interesting property this gives rise to is that the resistance, if you will, looks more like a resistor at that point because it's never turning off. And the resistance that it looks like is proportional to the forward current. So you wind up having actually a fairly linear relationship between forward current and the effective resistance of the device at RF frequencies. So uh, you now have a current controlled resistor. And then with zero or reverse bias, the junction capacitance is actually quite low because now the junction is actually quite wide between the P and N junction, so the capacitance is very low. So that means at zero or reverse bias, the, uh, the diode looks like a very low capacitance and therefore a very high impedance to RF. So obviously those things make for a really good switch, okay, by uh, being able to turn the diode on and have a nice low impedance to turn on and then we reverse bias to turn it off okay or, or zero bias to turn it off also if the resistance is varied with current that makes for a good variable attenuator a variable resistor can be used in a variable attenuator or also in modulator circuits or even adjustable phase shifter circuits but what's interesting too and we'll talk a little bit about this is the previous video that I did that talked about junction diodes and how they could be used as switches kind of operated on the principle that if we take and forward bias a diode su su sufficiently, say to right here, we can then send a, you know, a small amount of, you know, say AC current through that. As long as we don't kind of turn the diode off, this looks like a fairly low impedance, right? The slope of that line is the resistance of that diode. So that was the, the previous video I did that's linked below. Uh, basically shows how to use ordinary switching diodes as a switch. Now in the case of the pin diode, uh, we can kind of violate this a little bit. We can actually bring, you know, the voltage that we apply to it can actually go substantially negative and actually re reverse bias the diode. And as long as the junction or the bucket of charge doesn't get depleted and emptied, it will still conduct. So this allows us to switch relatively large RF currents 
with relatively small bias currents. So let's go take a look at uh, how that works. Okay, this is the circuit uh, I've got set up over here. Uh, we have a signal generator providing me an RF signal that's going on to this, the little board I built here that has a 0.1 microfarad series coupling cap that will block any DC just past the RF signal going through. And uh, a variable DC power supply up here just with a bypass cap to keep uh, things quiet. And then uh, just a set of resistors uh, so that as I vary the voltage on the at this point I can vary the current flowing through that diode. Now in RF applications one or both of these uh, are often replaced by RF chokes or inductors but uh, just to make our life easy here I just did it with a couple of resistors but the end effect is still the same. The value of these resistors is really not very critical. I wanted them to be you know substantially larger than the 50 ohm output impedance and 50 ohm load at the other end uh, so that's why I've chosen these values to be you know, six, uh, about 1K. The next resistor I grabbed was 680. I figured, oh, that's good enough, soldered it in. Okay. But uh, they could just be replaced by RF chokes. So we're going to be able to control the DC bias through the diode by varying that resistor, or the, excuse me, that uh, power supply. And then we take an AC couple, do another 0.1 microfarad cap into the scope that's got a 50 ohm terminated input. So essentially if we turn this diode on or off, we've created a series single pole single throw switch. So let's go take a look at what that uh, test board looks like. Okay, so here's the uh, little board I built to test out the pin diode. Uh, the pin diode is this white ceramic piece uh, right here, okay, with the little red dot indicating the cathode. So uh, my RF signal is coming in through this connector here going through this AC coupling cap, that's the 0.1 microfarad cap here. Now this is the 1K and 680 ohm bias resistors that are biasing up that uh, diode. And then this is the DC, oh, the coupling cap, the 0.1 microfarad cap that's taking my signal out and going out to the oscilloscope. So that's the very simple circuit that we use to evaluate uh, this, uh, this pin diode. So with the DC bias removed from the diode, uh, if we take a look at my signal generator, I've got a 10 megahertz signal being generated at uh, close 5 volts peak to peak. The reality is it's going to be a little bit less than that when we look at it on the scope because the impedance that's seen through my circuit is a little less than 50 ohms, but that's okay. So uh, I've got my RF signal coming out here that is going into uh, the diode. The diode is currently turned off with no DC bias turned on on it and then the output is going out to the scope. So I can see I don't see an, the RF signal on the scope at all even though I've got a 5 volt peak to peak signal being uh, injected into the front of that diode so we're effectively completely blocking that signal. The DMM here is measuring the DC current through that diode. So if I connect up uh, a DC bias from the power supply let's just uh, connect that up right here and now we go take a look I can see I've got about 2 milliamps of forward current through the diode and I can see my you know, 5 volt peak to peak RF signal at 10 megahertz. Now if you think about that this is a you know, plus, uh, I mean look it's not quite 5 volts peak to peak it's just a little over 4 volts peak to peak but let's just call it 4 volts so it's plus 2 volts peak and minus 2 volts peak. So two interesting things going on here. Ground, if I switch to ground, is right here in the middle. So this signal is swinging above and below ground so that means the diode is conducting in the forward direction and the reverse direction. And take a look at another piece here. I've got this is one volt per division, so I've got about two volts peak in each direction. Two volts across 50 ohms, that's 40 milliamps. So I've got 40 milliamps of forward current and 40 milliamps peak of reverse current through this diode, and it's not turning off. So this is all a function of having that stored charge in the diode. We talked about that in the uh, in this intrinsic region being like a bucket and storing charge and, and we're seeing the effect of that right here. This 10 megahertz signal is not going negative long enough to pull all that charge out of the intrinsic region so the diode is staying on. So uh, and that's another really interesting property of pin diodes is that with a relatively small forward bias current, we can switch relatively large RF currents. Unlike the 
previous situation when we talked about diodes, we had to kind of fully bias the diode on and not swing below the knee voltage. Here we're clearly reverse biasing the diode and it's still working fine. So let's take a look at what happens if we re you know, reduce the amount of charge that is stored in that junction. And we can do that by turning down the bias. So if I turn down the power supply here, okay, and now look at what happens. So if I'm, now I'm down where I've got you know, about 360, 370 microamps of current flowing through. I can see I've, I do have some forward bias here or, or some you know, forward current going through here during the positive half cycle of the RF. It is reduced, so the impedance of that junction or the, of the diode has actually been increased now. And then also when we, when we go to the negative half cycle, I can see I'm, I've got a substantial current flowing here and then I empty the bucket. Once the bucket empties out, then the junction starts to turn off, and then as soon as the forward cycle comes back on, it's coming back on again here. So I can see I just don't have enough forward current to, to fill the bucket enough, and if I bring the, uh, the current back up again, I can see right about here, oh, right about 1.5, 1 1.4, 1 1.5 milliamps for this particular diode is enough to give me enough charge in the bucket to fully conduct to this 10 megahertz signal. Now let's take a look, for example, if I reduce the frequency down to 1 megahertz. So now at 1 megahertz, the, uh, the signal is going to go positive or negative for a longer period of time. So now even, in this case, I've got 2 milliamps of forward current. That 2 milliamps of current isn't filling the bucket enough to allow you know, me to conduct fully for the negative half cycle of a 1 megahertz signal. I've got to turn that current all the way up okay so I'm about four milliamps now so now four milliamps is enough to cause that diode to conduct enough so that I've got enough charge to accommodate that negative half cycle of this much slower one megahertz signal let's go the other direction let's change that uh, RF signal to say 50 megahertz okay so now at 50 megahertz now let's uh, zoom in here on the scope okay so at 50 megahertz, certainly 4 milliamps is well more than enough to conduct all of that. If I reduce the current way down, I can see even way down, well below a milliamp even. Okay, Even at 500 microamps of current, I'm still fully conducting and giving that full amplitude of that 50 megahertz signal. So what we can see as the frequency goes up, we're spending less time on the lower half cycle, so there's not as much time to pull that charge out and thus the diode stays on longer. So in the case of the most recent repair that I did on that Yesu transceiver, these pin diodes were used to switch a 50 watt RF output. And if you look at the specs for these diodes, they can switch uh, you know, amps of RF current with just tens of milliamps of, uh, of forward DC current. So really useful for our high power RF switches. So uh, let's take a look at some of the other configurations that you can use for RF switches. The configuration I used on my test board it was just a series single pole single throw switch like this. Now of course you could also do a shunt single pole single pole th switch. Here when the diode's off it looks like an open circuit and the RF will pass right through. When I bring a bias up to send a current through this diode, the diode goes to a very low impedance and when it does it essentially shorts the RF signal to ground so of course the RF source has to be able to accommodate that without damage but that's another way to do a switch okay because again uh, just to review the the resistance of that diode varies linearly with the forward bias so another uh, situation by combining these two you can create what's called a series a series shunt single pole single pole switch and uh, what's interesting here is consider the situation where this bias voltage is brought positive. When it's brought positive, this diode will be reverse biased, so it looks like an open circuit, and this diode will be forward biased, it'll look like a short circuit. So now the RF signal is blocked two ways. It's got a high impedance to this point, and then from here it's got a low impedance to ground. So this style of switch will give you more isolation you know, more, you know, more isolation between, you know, when it's turned off than either one of these other two configurations. So it's really kind of the best of both worlds. And then if we bring the bias voltage down below ground, we would turn this diode on, which will create an RF path going through here, and it turns off this diode so I don't short to ground anymore. 
So a very common thing to use for pin diode switches. Uh, another interesting application is this one for a, uh, a, a example, say transmit receive switch. So where I have a transmitter and a receiver circuit feeding a common antenna. Now what's important here is to ensure that the transmitter doesn't overload or damage the receiver. So you want to be sure that the receiver doesn't see any of the transmitter energy. And here we're using a kind of a form of this uh, series shunt switch. But it's actually kind of interesting because uh, uh, one interesting property I have in here. So I've got one bias line. Okay, when that bias line comes up, we turn on this diode and that diode. So I've really turned this diode on and this diode on. So both of these look like a short. So you could say, well, how does that work? Well, in this case, when this diode looks like a short, that lets the transmitter see the antenna. But the important thing here to note is I've got a quarter wave transmission line. So it, for the frequency that I'm operating here, I've got a quarter wavelength transmission line. This quarter wavelength transmission line has got an interesting property that for the frequency at which it's a quarter wavelength long, it will provide the inverse impedance, okay, uh, or invert the impedance as seen at the output back to the input. So if you put a short circuit out here, it looks like an open there. So by biasing both these diodes on, that looks like a short. At the other end of the quarter wave transmission line, at that frequency, it looks like an open. The transmitter sees the antenna, and it looks like an open circuit going that way. So it doesn't see the receiver. The receiver doesn't see the energy. So pretty interesting property uh, of the transmit path. Now for the receive path, we, what we do is we just do the opposite. We remove the bias. This looks like a high impedance. Okay, the antenna then can go through, this looks like a, uh, an open circuit as well, so the antenna can just go through and see the receiver. The receiver would be impedance matched to the antenna, so the uh, transmission line is irrelevant. So this is an interesting way to do a transmit receive path with a pair of pin diodes that are controlled by a, a common bias line. So again, those are uh, some common switch applications. You can do single pole or double pole, multiple pole, multiple throw switches and things like that and also by taking advantage of the variable impedance, the current dependent impedance, you can create variable attenuators, modulators, phase shifters, etc. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this a little tour and uh, overview of what pin diodes are and how they can be used in switch applications and this really cool property of being able to switch relatively large currents with relatively small uh, biases. Thanks again for watching. And appreciate all your good comments. Thank you.